Good evening, and thank you so much for joining us for this very special event. I am Megan Rakepsel, the director of the Julio Fine Arts Gallery at Loyola University, Maryland, and I am thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce our speaker for this evening's program. But before I do, just a couple of housekeeping notes. Please connect with the Julio Fine Arts Gallery on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We are at Julio Art Gallery to keep up with our upcoming program announcements, including lots more information about our final virtual event of the academic year with artist Masa R. Fard on Thursday, April 22nd at 6.30 p.m. You can also find out more about the gallery's virtual and in-person programming on our website, julioartgallery.com or email us at julioartgallery at loyola.edu. We welcome your thoughts and feedback. The gallery is supported in part by the Maryland State Arts Council. To discover more about the Maryland State Arts Council and how they impact Maryland, visit msac.org. Finally, tonight's program is in the webinar format, and unfortunately that means we cannot see your faces or hear your voices, but we still very much want you to be part of the conversation. Please feel free to submit your questions for our speaker throughout the program through the Q&A function. We will do our best to get to all the questions. I am very pleased to be joined tonight by my colleague, Associate Professor of Fine Arts, Barnaby Nigerin, who will, along with myself, be facilitating tonight's conversation with our guest speaker. And now to introduce our speaker, Peter Schahalski. Polish-born, US-based multimedia artist, Peter Schahalski has in the past de decade established the Labor Camp, an ongoing art project that includes interactive components, digital and physical, original music, performances, videos, printed ephemera, texts, and an archive of online resources moving between painting, photography, drawing, installation, sound, media, art, and design, Shahalski's multi-layered works often explore communication and exchange, extreme historical phenomena, and relationships between the individual and society history and time. His work has been exhibited extensively worldwide and is featured in a variety of catalogs and publications. Shahalski is currently a professor of media arts at the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and the recipient of the 2009-2010 and 2017-2018 McKnight Artist Fellowships for Visual Artists. Shahalski is also the artist behind the now 226 drawing <laughs> that make up the COVID-19 labor camp reports featured daily on his popular Instagram account at labor camp from March 24th to November 3rd, 2020. As you might have guessed, Peter Shahalski has had a very busy year. Now I am very happy to turn over the proverbial stage to you, Peter, to give us a short introduction of your work. Thank you, Megan and, and Barnaby and, and uh, the Julio Art Gallery for having me. This is great. And yeah, it's funny, 226. <laughs> it was not really planned that way, but it happened anyway. Well, anyway, I'm great. I'm glad to be here. Um, hoping uh, we're going to have a nice conversation. And um, so we're aiming for a more conversational um, evening. Uh, so I'm going to try to go as quickly as possible through the images that I brought with me tonight. Let me share the screen. And So like I said, I'm gonna uh, try to go super quickly just to give you um, a, a lot of visual information that we can draw on uh, during our conversation. But I also wanna say that if there are any questions that come up as I go through these images, I'm more than happy to stop at any time and either elaborate on something or, or, or answer any questions or uh, spend a little more time on stuff. Okay, so... Um, I'm just going to acknowledge quickly the very diverse practice, uh, pointing out that uh, for a number of years I worked on screens. I started with some interactive work in the early days of the internet. I made this uh, crazy archive called Spleen um, uh, with a lot of work there. Also some of it that ended up being commissioned by the Walker, uh, Walker Art Center. I worked with artists uh, uh, such as Bjork and Smashing Pumpkins on some early interactive music videos. Um, 
worked on uh, interactive screen-based projects like this um, piece that was inspired by the large uh, color card displays on the stadiums uh, in North Korea or Soviet Russia, except in this case, the audience controls that experience. I worked with sound, I built my own software, I built objects that facilitate sound experience in the museums for the, uh, for the audiences. I released two albums. Um, I construct these participatory public uh, space uh, performative events. This is from an event called Empty Words based on John Cage's uh, famous text. Um, this is another example of the work called Geophone that uh, actually has uh, 20 speakers uh, buried in the ground and the audience has to actually lay down and listen to the, uh, put their ear to the ground, so to speak, to listen to the sound emanating from the uh, from the earth. I work on more traditional installations and the indoor spaces. Again, lots of technology. Most of these are very much interactive environments um, for which I often build custom objects um, like these uh, uh, designed and drawn um, labels for these Edison discs. And this is actually interesting work in terms of context for the COVID series because, because you can see um, in it a little bit of that aesthetic that ultimately ended up being part of that project. Um, so objects, this uh, Google search uh, themed uh, series of shovel, uh, shovels uh, called project called Sur Search Party, or these uh, uh, hybrid uh, tools that I called uh, labor camp orchestra instruments, um, or these pa small paper sculptures that were ultimately photographed as tintype. Um, and as it is the case, I often in mingle these various media um, and the, the large participatory performances often involve a number of these custom objects and printed ephemera. We're working all the time is one of those objects that become became a kind of a through line through connecting a lot of project, projects of mine. I, I sort of designed this poster over and over again. It's the same, always the same phrase, uh, just slightly different variations. And uh, these posters had become uh, a kind of a, a point of uh, connection for a number of ideas and, um, and modes of practice, I would say that um, I've been exploring over the years. So this is, uh, I think the edition number eight of the poster. There's a giant version of it that I painted for um, Soap Factory here in Minneapolis. Um, I also love, so posters are a kind of a, a mainstay in terms of language, visual language for me, but so are the leaflets. I've been designing leaflets uh, for, uh, for decades now. And um, I love that format. I love the fact that the, just the proportions of the paper, uh, its history, immediately brings in this very uh, clear, historic and uh, kind of political manipulative uh, context. They are very sinister by nature. Um, and I often use this format to interrogate the language of propaganda, the language of politics uh, and the way it translates into language of war or conflict. Build these custom uh, leaflet dispensing devices I'm going to go skip this video. Um, in order to have a little bit more time and talk to you about this project called Them. Uh, and I, I do want to give you a little bit more sense about this piece because um, it is, in my head anyway, very cl clearly connected with the COVID report project. Um, so this is a shot from a soap factory exhibition in which that project was uh, presented for the first time. So you can see these massive print pieces that I've um, uh, developed and printed on site inside the gallery. In order to do so, I built this contraption that is in the middle of the space that you can see that, that I, and uh, hand cut these uh, foam letters so that I can print the text one character at a time. And then these uh, messages are sort of a, difficult subject, angry notes that I made for myself uh, during the uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, demonstrations. So it were kind of response to the uh, economic inequities in our country. Um, and so when the, when the uh, opportunity to install this show came, uh, came up, 
I kind of uh, uh, looked at that text as the material. And so it became the, the textual content for these massive print projects. Uh, here's a few shots of the same project installed in different spaces where it sort of slightly uh, altered its form. Instead of these 12 feet tall, 42 feet long prints, I just kept conti continuing printing a single string of text. And this is the text of all these notes that um, uh, I was talking about earlier, kind of capturing that, uh, that moment. Um, and then I would print this for the duration of the exhibition. At the end, we would just cut off the, the, the banner and take it outside. Um, I call these events walkabouts, but um, they ended up articulating one of the key concepts of the, of the project, which is that in my mind, this, this object becomes something that is suspended just between the, uh, the new sticker text that sort of slowly travels at the bottom of your, of your TV screen and a protest banner. And this notion of, of, of our reality having been compressed so that the distance between a point of absorbing news and being on the street protesting the very news had become so short that uh, in this project, I felt that things were basically unfolding simultaneously. This video kind of gives you a little sense of the, how big this, this object is it's, and wrap around the city block. And oftentimes we simply walk around the block on which the gallery is located. Um, but the real reason why I wanted to show you this project is that um, as that exhibition in Soap Factory opened the very uh, next day, uh, we woke up to the news of the killing of Jamar Clark and um, in Minneapolis and the demonstrations were being organized that very day. And as I was reading the news, it occurred to me that I actually had this uh, massive print machine set up in the gallery. So I simply said, um, uh, I made this post and I said, please tell me what uh, what I should print on these banners and then come into the sub soap factory and pick up these banners. And uh, we started printing the banners uh, that morning, spend the day there. People sent their text requests. Um, some people came and helped to uh, print them. Folks started coming over to pick them up. And then the very the evening of that day, we would start seeing the images of the of the objects popping up back on the social media. And so a new chapter kind of unfolded for this project, um, uh, a chapter where I continue to offer this service in a way um, and continue printing banners for a variety of uh, protests, not just in the in the Minneapolis and the Twin Cities, but um, all over the country. There fairly light, this material, it can be shipped uh, easily. And um, really the, the, the kind of lesson of that, of in, of that emerged for me from this artwork was the, the realization of that shift, uh, the moment where the work um, or the ownership of the work transfers to the audience or, tra or, or the moment where the work becomes a kind of a service um, and uh, less a simply an expression of an individual, not to mention the, the fact that in the end, this particular project, the banner project, as, as opposed to them, which was simply my voice, it no longer is my voice. It actually becomes a kind of a platform or, um, or a service. So as a entry point to the COVID project, it really felt uh, meaningful to me to think about that moment of a, a kind of an I mean, I, maybe ownership is not the best word uh, to use, but the moment where the, the work begins its own life and my relationship with the work changes and becomes something else. And I, I've been saying this now uh, several times, but it really felt like at some point I stopped uh, thinking about this, the COVID project as my work, but rather it was uh, simply adjusting its, uh, its scope uh, capacity on a daily basis, and I was there to maintain its presence, to uh, uh, to tend to it in the way that one tends to a garden or a fancy piece of machinery that needs to be taken care of on a regular basis. So March twenty fourth um, was 
yesterday, correct? Um, <laughs> and that was a year ago um, where I ended up making a first drawing. I'm still sitting in the same space as you can see in the, uh, from the picture in the basement of, uh, of my house. Um, and I, I wanna say that I, I, the impetus for the very first drawing was um, a kind of a self-defense mechanism, uh, just needing something to do uh, uh, in this uh, early days of, of lockdown. And what I ended up drawing was, you know, very strangely, uh, an image uh, that came up in my dream the very night before. So the image on the left, uh, long live our banks, um, it, the, the image of that severed head with things growing out of its eye was just something that I dreamt. And I, it happens to me all the time. I do dream about doing work. And it was sort of that situation. I um, this image came to me in that dream, not the phrase, the long live our banks was a phrase that feels very much rooted in the, um, in the them project in the big banner project that was kind of acknowledging that those economic inequities. And, um, and I was already feeling or seeing that same dynamic playing out through, uh, this kind of mishandling of the, of the pandemic from the very early days. I mean, we were prepared for this. Um, by the previous three years of the of the regime, so um, so it was no surprise to see that that dynamic unfolding, and so both of those first drawings were very very directly confronting that um, that kind of background or that aspect of the of the situation. But the pictures that I'm showing you right now are pictures I was I posted on Facebook and on Instagram, and um, I am not sure why I'm not sure. Uh, what my own motivation was in the beginning. But what happened is that very, very quickly with the first two, three drawings, a kind of a conversation unfolded that um, made it apparent to me. And we were all starved for connection and for contact, even in those early weeks of lockdown. And so it became very clear to me that it, it, the a dialogical nature of this work was very present, even with those very few drawings. And so I kept making them. Uh, the conversations unfolded in more complex, richer ways. Um, and like I said, at some point, um, that relationship changed. And I, I did realize that I was actually offering a, a, some kind of service. Um, and this is uh, based on you know, multiple conversations that, un that un had unfolded, not only with the comments, uh, with the images, but through uh, public, uh, ch uh, private chats, the direct messaging, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, I'm gonna uh, go very quickly because obviously there are a lot of those images, 225 for the entire series. They're all still on Instagram. And if you go to Instagram and look me up, labor camp, one word, um, uh, you'll be able to see the entire series. I liked the way that this looked in Instagram as a kind of a grid and, um, and it was, you know, that and many other sort of aspects of the project uh, uh, made it very clear to me that there was uh, a kind of a record keeping that, that the project offered, not just uh, for myself, but for those who ended up joining that process um, kind of along the way. Um, so the projects obviously started as a way of acknowledging the pandemic, but, you know, as, as the uprising um, uh, became part of that reality, at least uh, not just here in Minneapolis, but eventually in the, uh, in the entire country and, and the world, uh, frankly, those, uh, those layers of um, kind of cultural and historic uh, content penetrated the, the work. Um, there are a number of uh, complex issues that became, uh, you know, very intensely present in the series uh, uh, as the year moved went on, we realized the intersection of so many issues uh, that the pandemic brought out um, uh, for all of us. So I have a, a few images here that sort of show the different ways that the project uh, interfaced with the audience. So obviously with Instagram in it, and that digital uh, sphere, but what was sort of fascinating about this is that um, very early on, folks kept referring to these as prints, even though what I was photographing was just ink drawings. And the fact that the assumption existed that these were pieces of printed matter uh, did lead me to 
right? that and a, and a kind of a, a, a wonderful opportunity that emerged via connection with um, uh, Tyler Page at MCAT, who is running the uh, our uh, service bureau, a print center, if you will, for MCAT. And what conversation led to actually making it possible, even under lockdown, to print these um, on these images. And so the very early exhibitions, like this one at the Rochester Art Center, only had 80 drawings because the series was still happening. So even as the work was uh, kind of being developed, the early presentational strategies already started to emerge from the in inside, as I call them, and now the show had, the work had been presented in numerous venues uh, in a more sort of traditional uh, art spaces. These are images from the Minneapolis uh, Institute of Arts, where the exhibition is on view right now. Very proud to have it in the, in the Minneapolis, finally accessible to, um, to my home audience, so to speak. Uh, I like this strange presentation at the Minnesota Museum of American Art in St. Paul, where the posters were print, uh, directly wheat pasted on the street facing windows of the museum. So not quite in the museum, not quite on the street, but just sort of on that skin of the art institution. And then of course the outside with Baltimore being the very first city where the, uh, the project kind of found its proper street presentation, the posters returned to the street, if you will, from the virtual, virtual public space of the social media. Um, and subsequently, uh, these are images from LA, uh, from New York City, from Philadelphia. Um, and then lastly, uh, and this is one of my favorite things about the arc of the project. So, and I, I call it from my porch to your home because ultimately what happened is that now that we, are, we have printed these as actual posters, um, I begin to see the images of these prints uh, uh, being posted by folks uh, who got the posters and are able to display them in their homes. I love that connection. The image on the left of the Until Hugs poster photographed by somebody with a beautiful play on the light come, uh, shining through the windows. It's one of my favorite images that to me kind of collapses the entire experience in a, in a wonderful way. Anyway, here I could actually talk about various themes within the project, but maybe this is a good moment to, to open it up for some questions. Maybe we can come back to the to the themes and, and digging in more detail. What do you think? Sure, I mean, that sounds great. Um, I think particularly since you just brought up uh, Baltimore, um, I'm interested now that we've heard a bit about the project and its origins, uh, I'm curious if you can tell us a little more about how these posters came to be in physical public space. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure some of our attendees had a chance to, a chance encounter with these posters in the street of Baltimore. So um, can you tell us how and when that developed and, and what shape the project took on from there? Right, right. I mean, um, like I said, uh, the part of the, the to me, fascinating ev evolution of the project was the assumption on the audience's part that they were print pieces of printed matter. Um, and so I say this because it's very true about the project, just about every new sort of dimension or new limb of it, uh, if you will, one way or the other is prompted by these conversations. And so um, I probably wouldn't have uh, felt the need to actually print these as posters if it weren't for the conversations and, the, and the kind of that assumption. Even though the poster format is very, close very dear to me and um, and one way or the other as you saw through some of the examples of the older work I I work with that relationship between text and images um, there is a, a kind of a visual uh, language at work there that uh, that is very familiar and a kind of a comfortable language for me to speak um, so um, I think the very first conversations about the notion that these posters should actually exist in public space must have happened in April, uh, maybe May. Uh, so very, very early in the, uh, in the early days of the project. And I guess part of it was also that most of the art institutions were actually closed, right? And, um, and so the public space 
became de facto the only space where you could encounter these things. And um, so the conversations began uh, in several ways, but it wasn't until uh, I, I started talking to Joseph Del Pesco from, from Baltimore um, a, about some way of, um, of kind of visualizing that presentation. And, um, and I think a big idea for us was that um, unlike typical distribution of printed matter or posters where you have one design and you print you know, thousands of these, uh, of these uh, imprints and often post them in formations of the same image sort of repeated that kind of classic experience and the image of the multiple posters um, uh, posted next to each other. In this case, my thinking was that it would be much more interesting to print only one uh, poster of each of the drawings uh, and but still put out a kind of a, a mass or a large quantity of them in a particular location so that it became kind of a, an exhibition that was happening in public space um, where these uh, encounters could slowly begin to build uh, a kind of narrative, a larger narrative that of course was reflecting the, the reality of that day. And so that's how the, the, the Baltimore presentation was, uh, or at least the format was conceived and wonderfully executed by a group of uh, volunteers um, that I will refer to as the Baltimore crew, because that was the, that was the, uh, that was, uh, that was the code name. Um, and, uh, and it really set the tone, I think, for the, for the subsequent months and the presentations in, in different cities. Um, so much like uh, with all those places, Baltimore too was a kind of a response to uh, someone reaching out and engaging in a conversation and saying, let's try to, let's figure out how to do this. Do you think that, um, that the, the idea that the posters would then be in these public spaces out, outside in the cities, did that change the way that you approached what you decided to draw in really the subsequent months? Yeah, interesting question. I, <laughs> I, don't, know if, I don't know if it did. Um, uh, but I will say that, um, okay, I'd like to say no, that it did not change my thinking about uh, about what I was drawing. But, but I do want to say that from the very first presentation, um, it was clear that some images, some of the drawings, the act of posting some of them in the public space carried a different kind of um, vulnerability uh, along, you know, uh, with it, with its content, with its messaging, and and I know that we, this was part of a conversation with every crew, really, in in every city, um, and and I think the, a big part of that conversation was also that, and I I kept always saying this that you only should do what you feel comfortable doing, and um, and if it doesn't feel right there's no there's no need or no reason to to put yourself in a position where um, you either are vulnerable or just uncomfortable doing this and so i i fully understand that there was there was kind of a range a different um different weight of that gesture uh that was connected to those drawings and so maybe uh going it deeper into the project perhaps understanding that i would think about it, but not necessarily to the point where I would change uh, what the drawings are. That said, there are several drawings in a series where um, I would stew for a long time in that on, on that particular morning about making that particular image. Uh, some imagery uh, felt much more difficult for me to uh, to process or to uh, consider putting out there. Um, than others, you know. So um, I think I'll I'll jump in here, and we're we're starting to get questions, and and maybe we can switch over to those shortly. But the first thing I'd say is I didn't expect this, but as you showed um, your slides, I got incredibly emotional um, a, a, about it, and and, I'm, and I think some of it is is the sense that you know we're coming out of this, but also some of it was, um, as, as I've expressed to you previously, how much those posters meant to me um, in those particularly dark days and you know during my one hour walks to get out of the house. 
and sort of the way in which which those those pieces as as they began to appear in Baltimore kind of um, reified and crystallized some of the feelings and and ideas and frustrations that I was having um, both about COVID and and the broader political situation that we were living with. So. I guess I'm going to kind of uh, change my original, what I was originally going to ask you to in, in, in some degree, but because I think you talked quite a bit and certainly you can, you know, if you feel like it, you can talk more about the, the, the real and virtual aspect of this project and how it relates to your earlier work, um, right. the work that you were narrating uh, when we start, when you started. But I was also actually thinking about it in terms of, of your experience with the poster generally, both as a poster maker Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with your experience of the poster in, in Poland growing up. Right. And then, um, you know, your, 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 your thoughts about, about sort of analogous traditions of, of poster posting that we saw, um, you know, with the AIDS crisis and, and other moments in, in, in history that, that had a similar bleak quality, if not necessarily in such a totalizing way, but for yeah. individual populations. Well, first of all, thank you for, for sharing your experience, Barnaby. I mean, it really is, uh, to me, that's the real currency, that's the real um, value uh, in the work, right? Is that, I guess we always hope for that connection to happen, but um, I don't know, the, the dynamic of the moment, uh, moment, <laughs> the year uh, uh, is such that I feel, um, we all kind of uh, perception of the world, perception of ourselves, uh, maybe an opportunity for introspection um, uh, presented itself for all of us and in, in different ways, whether we were thinking about it in that way or not, I feel like we were all uh, really processing uh, things in a like profoundly different way. Um, so that emotional connection that you, that you were describing, um, I'm, I have those moments constantly. I, I literally had one of those moments just this morning because I was talking again to somebody on, on Instagram, somebody I don't know really, but I, we had this like, you know, really meaningful exchange about, about in this case, about being in the, in the, at the MIA in the exhibition and kind of physically uh, taking in the entire project, which is a very different experience from, uh, from you know, experiencing assembly on the phone. Um, and for me too, as I was making these drawings, there are a number of uh, of pieces that um, I was just I was just talking to my wife about this. I'm I'm literally choking up just thinking about this because um, I had a craziest dream a uh, couple of weeks ago. I I woke up with this. I'm not going to tell you the whole dream. Anyway, it just was so it was so like intense. I was discombobulated at like five o'clock in the morning and, and I ended up just watching some random videos on online. And I don't know what got me, but somehow I landed at the video of this um, concert. I don't know if you guys remember this in the middle of the, of the pandemic, uh, um, the, the tenor, uh, oh my God, I'm blanking his name right now. Um, I can't believe the Italian uh, opera singer, the tenor, uh, uh, sang in the empty uh, basilica in Milan, I think. Um, Botti no, not Bocelli, I was going to say Botticelli, that's not a singer. Um, uh, and I listened to this again, and I remember we watched this live because it was a big event. Uh, and we were watching this video as I was drawing the poster. Uh, that is entitled breathtaking and it's just this uh, kind of drifting boat and a uh, uh, guy is sitting in a in a boat staring at his phone and the whole uh, sea is on on fire um, and it's just incredible because when I was listening to this concert again I just could not help myself you know the tears were rolling down my eyes the same way as they were when I was making that drawing and you know like that's to me um, there's this sort of emotional um, I don't know, like edges were so fuzzy uh, of uh, like our emotional space that I could, you know, I could easily just sort of like fall into that, into that, uh, that kind of mindset. And then five minutes later, I'll be fine and focusing on what I was doing. This happened over and over with different drawings. 
the reason why I'm talking about this is because I, I, that was one of my charges. My personal charges was to stay really true and honest to how I was feeling with these images, right? And so, Megan, to your question earlier about like second guessing, um, you know, how these things might uh, operate on the street, that was really not the consideration. The consideration was to be present in that moment. Every day it was a different thing, right? Uh, to be true to what that feels like in that in that moment. Uh, not to sort of strategize about its uh, its life beyond that that moment. And I think the fact that um, I only had the 24 hours, so to speak, to work be with this one drawing. Um, for me, looking at these at this body of work right now, feels almost like somebody else did it. There was this very, very strange uh, shift that I think has also something to do with this idea of ownership being transferred or or just sort of dissolving in the in this very kind of intense and dense uh, fabric of the of the project. I'm gonna I'm gonna quickly. Uh, share my screen again if you don't mind because Barnaby I want to show you something I um because you asked about this uh early experience from Poland I actually just found these um I found these this these images all right so what you're looking at is I have no idea what how this happened this is a front and back of a hunk of like printed matter I tore off a wall in Poland in the 80s. So the dates on this thing, as you can see, it's 1981. Um, I tore it off the wall because I wanted to keep it, preserve it. I don't remember doing it uh, or exactly when in what situation and i certainly had no idea that i brought it with me here from poland like what the hell was i thinking i don't know but um what you can what you can see in this thing is just how thick the layers of the printed matter are right i mean the walls were covered with this with uh some of what you see is the news bulletins and some of it is just um sort of uh a poster work really so this these it just happens to be the case. These two artifacts, the upper right hand corner and lower left, are kind of an echo of this uh, printed matter uh, object that in Poland would be very common when somebody dies, there would be a family would commission a small number of these prints uh, made with their name, date of death, and announcement about their funeral. And there would be this black trim around this and they would be posted on the wall by the door where that person lived uh, in the neighborhood and then by the church where the service would be carried, et cetera. So it's like a public space announcement, uh, like an obituary, but without much of a text, just to let people know, informational one. So these two are kind of like mock um, announcements and on the one on the left simply announces that the, that the justice died. <laughs> um, and looking back at these now, just sort of thinking about our conversation, I, I thought, okay, well, this is actually an interesting example of this weird language of like uh, um, subterfuge, or if you will, right? Or the double meanings or the idea of playing with an existing uh, visual language and then kind of shifting its function to deliver a different kind of experience, different idea. Um, that is something that, absolutely is, has been part of my um, my upbringing, me growing up. Um, I just happen to have this particular hunk of, of printed matter torn up some wall in Poland, but you know, this is true for like movie posters, theater posters, uh, the actual political propaganda that the, the that regime would be, you know, uh, placating everywhere. Um, but the notion of, uh, the poster being the kind of visual language of the space, the street, where the actual uh, work of democracy is taking place, where we are the language that is used to discuss, you know, to connect uh, over important issues. That notion had been sort of always there uh, in my head anyway. Um, understanding that um, was part of my 
probably formative experiences back in Poland, but it is present to this day. And so there is a, an arc there for sure. Well, that, that was fascinating. And that, that artifact is amazing. And it is, it is remarkable that you, that you kept it. It is so strange. <laughs> I, don't, I have no explanation, but I'm so glad I have it. <laughs> I think it's um, a good time to turn to the, the first question that we got from um, a colleague of ours, Remy. Uh, he says, fascinating posters, thank you. Two questions. One, I saw the war COVID poster flash by a few times. What was your intention behind that image? And what are your thoughts about military metaphors used in COVID discourses? Yeah. And the second question, uh, do you want to answer that first and then come back to the second question? Or do you want to- I, I can do this. Yeah, the, okay. it's, it's a great question because uh, the, 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 the handling or mishandling of COVID was instantly labeled as a war, right? On, on invisible enemy or whatever. Um, by the regime and you know it's such a familiar uh dynamic we've seen this happen over and over uh everything is a war and of course part of it is very simple you know if we if we are engaged in a war then you know your standard uh ethical norms don't apply and you can do whatever right because it's an emergency situation and new measures have to be put in place it's a perfect excuse to to do horrendous things and it also um plays into the all kinds of mindsets and attitudes that uh, we've seen play out in our country in US um, over the decades. It's, it's a very familiar pattern, right? And so I, I immediately understood that the format of poster design uh, will be the, the right language to talk about this crisis, right? But in a very uh, particular way. So that first image that just says war, and I think that the subtitle for that one is back to normal because I was acknowledging the fact that we're once again, you know, engaging in some kind of made up uh, war dynamic. Uh, that was the back to normal that of course had nothing to do with the idea of returning to, to normalcy <laughs> outside of uh, pandemic. But, um, but that also said a kind of uh, one of the many trajectories for the project where there are there are scores of images in the series that are very directly connected to to war propaganda to the language of propaganda um again uh just like that with that kind of silly example from this uh from this polish uh uh print that i just shared with you m most of it in my mind anyway um accomplishes several things uh simultaneously a, it connects to actual historic historical context, right? So it enlarges the kind of understanding of the image in that way. Uh, but I also often uh, subvert that energy and, and use that language in, in a way to kind of fold in on itself or uh, eat its own tail, all right? So the propaganda is, you can identify the, the properties or the, the quality of that language, but what it begins to deliver uh, eventually begins to dismantle its very, its very logic. Um, so there, there's like layers of this, um, um, uh, of meanings, I guess I would say, uh, that are to me almost synonymous uh, with poster uh, as, a, as a visual language. You know, those, uh, those movie posters that I was talking about that often uh, would just um, become, ways of uh, critically uh, acknowledging and responding to the political dynamic back in Poland never had a, a single layer of meaning. There were always subtexts, there were always uh, nuances or uh, ideas that would be presented in a very uh, kind of clearly uh, strategically developed way. To me, that was, the, um, that was the, the kind of mastery of that language where you can actually construct a, a piece of uh, visual information that can be experienced in one way and then two seconds later you unfold a different set of meanings and then 15 seconds later it begins to form a question in your head whether what you just experienced was this way or that way you will see that the dynamic playing out in many of the COVID drawings where um where kind of what seems on the surface folds itself into a, a, a question that um maybe helps you come to terms with an aspect of reality that that particular drawing reflects. But that kind of uh, uh, critical dynamic is, uh, to me anyway, rooted in 
um, partly in the, the language of, or the war references, but also just uh, the fact that posters are kind of inherently connected with all of those um, contexts, not just in this country or Poland, but, you know, all the countries all over which the is world. why which is why goya keeps coming up right i mean <laughs> as, as we as we talked about last time because yeah. that that same sort of level of ambiguity of of image words that change how you read the image that change how you think about the words um is, is a really sort of powerful thread that i think runs through a lot of the a lot of the a, a lot of the works in this series yeah i think there's like a layer of crudeness to to that language but Part of it because it compresses things to such a, a two-dimensional space, but I think that uh, you know it's like with minimalism. You can say that it's just the stuff is just simple, right? But it's not that simple. Uh, it's not simplistic. It's just there is a beauty in the simplicity. I feel like there's something like that. That I know it's a little, it's a it's a tall order here, but I want to say that there's something about the crudeness of the language of propaganda and political manipulation that has the capacity to operate on that level if you just sort of you know turn it on its side or or turn it just a little bit so that a different um vantage point is open then it suddenly begins to speak uh, in much more poetic terms very much along the lines of holzer or kruger for sure degree. exactly yeah. exactly exactly you want I to mean, ask some, the second part some, of the question? Sorry, go ahead. Yes. I'll, just, I'll just say one more thing because some of the leaflets I was showing you earlier were literally just trans, translations of the actual messages that we were putting on leaflets and dropping in Iraq during the uh, Iraqi freedom operation. So it would say things like, um, uh, let's see, honor can never be regained no matter the cost. Like, what does that mean exactly? And, and you know, yeah, they would be sort of sandwiched with the picture of uh, Saddam on the dinar notes. But if I say it in our context, then it suddenly blossoms in a very different way, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, so the second part of this question, I think it fits nicely into this conversation is, um, some of your images seem to take aim at neoliberalism as the uh, something that exacerbates COVID suffering. Do you think the neo neoliberal economy can have a positive role to play in getting us out of this mess? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm speechless. Um, uh, <laughs> well, okay. Uh, the, I guess the simple answer to this, uh, I would say, no, um, it's a it's it's a catastrophe. I mean, it's uh, so so we can just leave it there. Um, but do I know uh, a way out? Or can I point to a, a kind of a systemic structure or ideology that can do this for us? No, I don't. I can't. Um, but I will say this: that I'm hoping that the one thing that the pandemic, the experience of the pandemic, global experience of the pandemic brought, and I, I really like sincerely believe this, is that, it, that it, it gave us an opportunity to uh, kind of recalibrate a little bit the way we see the world, the way we see each other, the way we see ourselves. Uh, and it's, sometimes it's just a simple thing. The idea of confronting our own mortality I think we all had to ask that question at some point uh, over this course of a year. But most importantly, and I think really uh, genuinely, uh, if there is a, a kind of currency in this, uh, in this disaster, that I think it is um, that maybe we're just a little more prepared to pay attention to each other, to another human being, to really engage with each other through empathy um, and understand that on our own, we can't make it, we can't do it. This is not um, how it, this, this is not how we are supposed to be with each other. And so um, I've always been saying that I, not always, but recently for me, uh, an understanding of art as a social act is sort of like the foundation. I, I have to I had to come to terms with this um, with this notion that I'm not doing this for myself. I'm doing this so that a I can 
uh, commune with another human being. And then hopefully when, when something uh, important happens that the work actually allows other people to uh, negotiate the, the space between uh, themselves. So if I, you know, if I, um, if I am able to accomplish that goal, I can imagine that there's some chance of rebuilding um, everything that we have lost over the last, uh, I don't even know how many years, because, you know, since we're talking neoliberalism, I'm, you know, I'm going all the way back to Reagan and, and the, the, the disasters that, that followed. And the last year are just like, even on that playing field, a kind of a, uh, incredible, uh, like a, like a <laughs> goiter of ne neoliberal thought or something. Uh, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a political scientist by any stretch, um, but I am actually in a kind of unique uh, position to speak from the experience of living in a corrupt communist country and an experience of living in a corrupt capitalist country. <laughs> and I can tell you that uh, even though when I was moving here, uh, the notion at least back in Poland in, of the 80s was that the US was the promised land, you know, it was the answer to all the problems. And in fact, it's just con continues to really blow my mind. The fact that in the 80s in Poland, we would look at Reagan and think, my God, this dude is awesome. I mean, way to stick it to the commies, you know? Um, and I am I'm thinking about myself thinking that then and thinking, oh my God, you know, like how incredible is that, that we can think about the same person uh, in, in this completely diametrically op op opposite way now, uh, you know, like a disaster was taking place as I was thinking, yeah, um, there's a real like humbling lesson there. Um, and so uh, the long or answer to your question, I think winds me back to simply saying, I don't, I don't believe the answer to those problems will come from uh, ideologies from systemic structures. They will have to come from us really being with each other in a thoughtful way, uh, in a, uh, with empathy, with generosity, um, and, and love really. <laughs> One of the images that I hadn't seen before, um, and I don't want to monopolize this, um, but th that really struck me and, and fits in with your answer is that one that has the series of raised fists that says something like essential worker, essential right, workers, right. because it, it, you know, it, it made me think how the notion of first thing, I'm obviously the central work of, of, of anti-racism, right. but also the way in which it, it, it changed, at least in moments, the way we thought about the nature of work, because totally. the people who became essential workers were the people who were putting toilet paper on the shelves for us, mm -hmm. right? And who were getting paid seven dollars and fifty cents an hour to do that. Um, and 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 I, I thought that work particularly, which I don't, which again I don't think I saw um, posted in Baltimore, but really resonated with me. It was there following somewhere. along the lines of Remy's question. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I think that in many ways that is that was the impetus for that image, right? To simply say yes. There are so many essential labors that need to be happening or are happening, you know, whether we acknowledge them or not, that's a whole different story. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, what a crazy, awesome question that was, honestly, it just threw me for a loop because, and I still, I keep, I keep thinking about this too, because, <laughs> because I didn't even mention environment and, 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 and the complete sort of destruction and demolishing of of the of the planet that is you know somehow the price we're paying for this crap sorry <laughs> um there's some uh interesting questions that are along the lines of sort of more technical um which is where i was going to go next anyway mm -hmm. so i'd love to ask you this question from one of our students courtney kenny um, I'm drawn to the typography used in your posters, and it's incredible that it's all done by hand. Mm -hmm. What goes into your decision on the fonts that are used in each poster? Also, do you think there's a connection between creating the posters by hand and the emotional connections you have with those that interact with the project? Totally. Um, 
the, the to the latter uh, portion of a question, 100%. There's no question in my mind. I mean, that's why I, I for most part, try to refer to them as drawings because really they they are right there's and i showed you these couple of videos in the beginning because it really is uh, not just not just the, the the fact that the whole thing is drawn with the same you know um brush pen but also um and i'm proud to say this uh the entire series each drawing is just one drawing I, i've never redone anything i've never un had undone anything about that drawing so what what happened that morning was it right and so there was a really kind of precarious uh aspect to that but i felt that that was the only way to again maintain that sense of like sincere connection with what i was doing if i made uh a decision at that moment that that things were going to be configured in that way that was it i mean i made some sketches obviously right that's part of the um development uh that morning but things I had to move fairly fast. Um, I mean, I talked earlier, you were talking about sort of ritual uh, of this, Megan. I, I I had to very quickly, I realized that I, I would have to uh, be getting up super early. So 5.30 ended up it. I had an alarm clock set at 5.30 and I would wake up, go straight in the shower, uh, you know, to try to bring myself to, to life somehow. And, you know, coffee, uh, read the, the, the news for maybe an hour or so, uh, stick my head outside of the front door, breathe some fresh air, come down here and, and start working. Uh, first some pencil sketches, then a larger version of the sketches, then the full, full thing in pencil, and then the ink. And, uh, you know, if I did a efficient job on the day, I would probably be done in about five hours, sometimes nine you know who knows i mean it was it was um it was really in some respects really intense as a as a process right um so it's if i say nine hours it sounds like a long time but it's not if you think about having to develop the whole thing articulate something and then execute it in that amount of time so the decisions about type or or uh, particular letter treatment um, in some instances, I am very kind of conscious about how the letter forms um, connect to some historic traditions. You know, when I use black letter, I'm using it on purpose because, you know, it resonates in a particular way. Um, so I would be thinking about uh, about that aspect of it. And so some in some instances, the choices for uh, for typography or handling of the letters would be uh, dictated by those kind of conceptual or thematic references. Um, other times, and this is really true of the whole series, I would say, is that um, it is just a drawing. Um, it is me with a, with black ink making a drawing on a on a page. And uh, I this is now I've said this many times, but I'll say it one more time. I think of me doing those drawings literally in the same tradition or the way that I imagine a landscape painter paint, painting landscape in the, in the field, right? And their concern is the landscape, how beautiful it is. My concern was the social and political and cultural landscape that was unfolding in front of all of us via media, our phones, et cetera, et cetera. I'm drawing that. I'm drawing what I see, what I'm experiencing in that space. Um, and part of it is, that in order to articulate these things, I am using that particular language that feels and looks like a poster that has typography in, within it that uses words and images. Most of, like, almost all of those posters really have a kind of a balance of the two. I think there's one or two drawings that don't have like prominent text except for the, the numbers and the title, uh, but most of them, use language in the, in, the, in the same way as you, I use images. And because of English being my second language, I really do think that there's something about my way of thinking about those words that is very visual. So I actually think of them a lot like images. So I, I do respond to a letter form because of the way it looks maybe sometimes more than what the word actually might say 
I mean, it's a stretch, but you know what I'm trying to say is that the way that the, a word might a kind of contain a certain symmetry might be precisely the thing that makes me notice that word in an article that I'm reading that morning. So part of the process for me was collecting bits and pieces of text. I, I called it a news shrapnel because they were like bits and pieces that would just get stuck in my head as I was reading them in the morning. I would just write them in my phone, sometimes cut and paste directly from, from the article. And so a kind of an interesting artifact that was that came out of the series is this list of these phrases and words that, hold on, I can actually, that is in the notes app in my, in my phone. Um, you know, and it would have things like, um, success, it will go away, failed state, wash your hands, uh, bed, lungs, bags of money, upside down, uh, weapons, essential work, no immunity, mass suffering, normal, we're open, chaos, et cetera, et cetera. They're just words, right? That I happen to read something, a story in, I don't know, um, New York Times or, uh, or, or maybe um, Heather Cox Richardson, the, the this historian that's been uh, publishing daily letters from uh, letters from an Amer from American, which I started following early on in the series. There's a drawing in in the series uh, called "The Future Remains Unwritten," which is literally the last phrase from one of her texts. Um, so these these words uh, became the impetus. But what I'm trying to say is that sometimes. I see them already as images, not just what they bring in kind of uh, textually in a play, but rather how they operate visually, how they might resonate with images that I ended up that I end up working with. That relationship, the tension between text and image is like essential to almost every single one of these drawings. The essential work is a good example of that because the phrase essential work had been in my notes from very, very, early on in the series because we instantly were talking about the essential workers. But I didn't make that drawing until the uprising where I realized that the phrase essential work suddenly gains a whole different uh, meaning. And that was the moment where I thought, okay, I understand now there's, there's real like charge in using that phrase in that context. Um, but that the words essential work was in that list for weeks, you know, and part of the morning ritual was that every morning I would read the whole list to myself. I, you know, I would add new things, but I would read the whole thing and allow each one of those words to kind of percolate in the context of that day, right? Was there some, was there a different way I'm, I was really feeling that word today? Like the word chaos, for example, you know, was there too from the very beginning. Did it mean something today? Is it going to mean something tomorrow? How different? Why? What is the tension? So there were definitely strategies that emerged in the project um, because it lasted so long, eight months. Yeah. Um, I, I think this next question uh, from Catherine Kennedy is a, is a good sort of um, follow up to some of that, which is, uh, she says, was there certain, were there certain themes that you found easier to tend like a garden, meaning that the posters sort of came easier into form mm. than others. And then going off of that, were there certain themes that were harder to come into form for you? And do you have a sense of, as to why? Mm. Well, I can very quickly think of the difficult ones and, and somehow I'm having a hard time thinking of easy ones. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that perhaps is indicative of the nature of the su subject matter and the time that that they were all uh, put together in. But uh, easy, no. Um, I, I, in fact, I can simply say none of this was easy because even the one there are drawings that feel very tender in a way or quiet or or they feel more like a, a you know a kind of a whispered uh, text rather than something I'm really feel upset about that morning and I feel like I need to you know kind of scream about this 
Um, so there are definitely kind of ebbs and flows in the in the series in terms of that emotional engagement, emotion, emotional intellectual engagement, you know, whichever, or, or balance of both. Um, so some of them are very loud. Some of them are, you know, biting and and the language of irony or satire is there, and there's a kind of critical language that is um, cutting. Um, but like I said, there are also some that feel very, very different. And those would be the ones that I would have to point to and say, those would be the easier ones, right? Because the other ones are, but that was not easy at all. Um, you know, there was a, just a different kind of uh, challenge. You know, maybe those were even harder. I don't know. Maybe it's easy to scream. I. I, I I think that there's maybe, like, if you push these things way out into some kind of extreme, then maybe that's get that gets easier. Yeah, it's just a tricky word. I I, I don't know. Um, so was there a two part two parts to this question, or was that? No, uh, I think that, that, that that's that's a pretty good answer to that one. There was, there was definitely a, a dynamic range, and I um, I've worked with the format of a series for in many instances. In fact, looking back, I kind of realized that almost every project that I do is a kind of a series, that there's multiple components to it. And, and I think I do this because there is always an opportunity to really think of different relationship to the subject matter within the series, right? Now, some things could be very close to the heart of the issue. Others could be more poetic or more um, ambiguous in a way that they open more of a, a space for the audience to, um, to enter that, that work. So some will be you know, um, simpler or, or uh, the, the kind of center of gravity of the work will be located much closer to its surface and others will have multiple layers of things happening. And so I, I, I think about these things all the time. And with this, with this series, it was absolutely like one of the uh, key, I would say dynamics for me is to understand just that the, each individual drawing can actually unfold in several directions in, you know, and, and I can point to it and say, you know, this portion of the drawing to me connects to that, you know, like there's a, there's the the total authority drawing this one of the early ones but it's just a black background there's a skull in the middle uh mm -hmm. with a crown hanging over it and it just says total a, a total authority which was the phrase that you know the our uh, great leader was using to refer to 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 his his own powers um and that poster that drawing uh i floated that skull in the middle of that black field echoing the Hitler's uh, uh, election poster when he was uh, first, uh, you know, um, appearing on the scene, so to speak. It's a very iconic image. It's just his head floating in a black field with the word Hitler on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I looked at that type and the R from Hitler is the R I use in total authority, right? So you can actually like look at the two side by side and you go, oh yeah, I totally see it. Uh, and even the composition of it, right? The, the skull floating in the middle where his head used to be. But the crown over, over the skull's head is a nod to the uh, keep calm and carry on uh, image, right? With the, with the crown, except I substituted the crown with the Corona beer crown um, that instead of a little cross on top has a, a dollar sign, right? So it's like, a, it's like layers of references that you might not, catch at all or you might notice one of those things but to me that matters to me that's me using the language of the poster um, in a way that is you know informed or in a way that I understand that uh, this word if somebody says that word that it carries a certain charge because of the the context in which it has been used before like the word war that we were talking about earlier or authority or power. Um, so yeah, each one of those drawings to me is like, you know, like a double, triple bottom with stuff just tucked in uh, in, in different ways. Um, 
and then there's 225 of them. So, 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 so I can then also like develop the ideas across the series between the images. And there are a number of them that kind of speak to each other in, uh, in unique ways. Well, that's an excellent segue into this um, question from uh, Jake Freeman, which is, what is your vision for how the indoor collection should be displayed? Would you organize the posters chronologically or, and if so, would it be intended to create a sort of timeline of your thought process and a state of mind throughout the pandemic or, or do you see them sort of more thematically organized? Uh, chronology is it. Um, it, it. It's first and foremost, uh, it's a record, um, and uh, yeah, I, I uh, to be perfectly honest, um, I would not. No, it's it, it, to me they're always in, they always have to be in chronological order. You have to be able to trace that. This is why each one has a date, um, and on not just a date, but also I have been including the numbers of of cases and deaths and you can you you can literally see the, the the disaster unfolding as you move from one image to another um i feel that there's something um you know so on one hand it operates in a very journalistic way right just uh um kind of writing down what what's hap what's happening on the day and i feel that's a, a, a very important layer of the work is that it bears witness to the to the to the circumstances to the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, situation and I I think it was in the I think it was b b even before the pandemic I think I read some article where somebody a historian was sort of pleading with people to uh, write journals because uh, this is the only way that the history will really understand what was happening because obviously the manipulation of not just the past, but the manipulation of what our perception of reality is uh, at that moment is, had been so severe um, that we had to have some other evidence, some other document of what actually transpired, right? And so I, I feel that the the part of the a big part of the work is really to do that job too, to actually be present, reflect, record, and there's an element of service that kind of comes with that way of thinking about the work that is very real and very important to me. So the chronology is uh, a way of uh, just kind of gently acknowledging and underscoring that. Um, so, but it also works in other ways, right? You can, you can it becomes a narrative too. Um, it, it is a story that I'm telling, but it's also, uh, an opportunity for you to uh, connect with that story or ask yourself questions about what your experience on that day was. Are you connecting with this image? What, what, if not, what happened with you on that day? How, you know, where did your mind go? Where was your heart in that, in that situation? So there is a, a, a way of building that connection, at least uh, right now, you know, I, I feel we, we're all still in this, in this moment. Um, you know, earlier, uh, Megan, when you were uh, doing your introduction, you used the phrase extreme historical phenomena. I definitely, it's been a, a kind of a focus for me for, for decades. Well, this is, this is an extreme historical phenomenon. There's no question about that. And we're kind of in its, in its belly still. Um, so to, uh, to report on it, which is why that word is, uh, is part of the title of the whole series. Uh, felt like an urgent, important thing to do. Not just for me, but I, my, my sense was that we all need to be doing this, right? Um, so yeah, there is a, um, the chronology would have to be and is for me the default uh, presentation. I kind of dream of the display where they are all simply presented in one line next to each other. It would be a very long line um, and I'm not sure how that would happen or where, maybe someday, but um, so far it's these gridded surfaces had been kind of the, the, the way that the, we can maintain the chronology, but also to allow the kind of work as a whole to speak.
You could do it while you could display them while you're waiting in line for one of the mass vaccination clinics, like there at the convention go. center. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably like the walls that. would be long enough, and it would take you long that's, enough to get through the line. That's sort of like scarily <laughs> plausible. <laughs> um, um, I think we're we're coming close to an end here, um, but I there's one more question um, from our colleague Carrie about sort of the the end of the project. Mm. Um, because I know that, you know, your, your quote unquote last drawing was on November 3rd, right. 2020, but then I, I know you also did uh, a drawing yesterday, which right. I hope that you can show us if you have a, an image of it with you. Um, I did just put it away though. Um, I would have shown you the actual drawing. But, <laughs> okay. Um, um you know, but why, why you pull that up, I, I just thought I would ask uh, sort of a follow up on that sort of ending is reflecting a little bit on the anniversary of the beginning of the project, which was yesterday. Right. Um, many things have changed dramatically and yet so many things are still very much the same. So how has your life changed and what's next for you with respect to your work, but also this this project? Yeah, I, I only could just now bring up the, the Instagram oh. post. Um, so this is this is the drawing from yesterday um but this is the really the light and i know you said quote unquote this is the end of the series uh, <laughs> november 3rd november 3rd was the um the point i i decided uh was going to be the end of the project for a number of reasons <clears throat> i mean honestly when i started when i made the first drawing i thought that i was going to well, I, I didn't know I was going to make two of them, you know, to be honest. But somehow the the conversation that uh, that started, and I realized I actually had like seven sheets of paper here, so I made the second and third. And I thought maybe seven was going to be it because I was going to run out of paper. But then somebody said, "Oh, I can give you a paper, and I have more ink, and just keep going." Um, anyway, um, the question of how to end the project was always there, and. Um, the deeper I went into the work, the more, um, uh, I don't know, like I, I wanna say that um, I'm not sure exactly at what, at what point I, I realized that November 3rd was going to be the end of it. But, um, but I did realize early on that when I was imagining going a long time, the election was like the furthest my mind would go. Like I never thought of it going any further than that, as if though uh, there wouldn't be any point or any reason to go any further. Um, and the closest, the closer we got to that day, the more real that became. And and uh, part of it is honestly that the 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 ten, no matter what the outcome of it was going to be, you know, that's what the last drawing ended up being, just kind of coming to that that edge uh, of the next day. No matter what the outcome of it was going to be. Uh, the project would have to change. It would have to sh shift its tone, uh, its its sense of urgency or engagement with the reality would have would have to dramatically change in, to the point, in my mind anyway, that it would be a, something else. Um, of course, there were other drawings earlier where I committed to the notion that this was going to be the end of the regime, no question, um, it was. Um, and, uh, and so to me, that was really the, the, the fact that it was, yes, it was the record of the, the pandemic experience, but it was also the record of the, of the uprising. It was, uh, also the record and the reflection of those economic inequities that were, uh, coming, becoming apparent to us in more and more vivid, uh, color, uh, and, it also was the record of the end of the regime. And um, so that was the date I chose, the November 3rd. And um, it is the end of the project. I, I drew this, uh, the, this image yesterday, um, call, it, call it an epilogue because of the anniversary. And it just felt, uh, I don't know, it felt right to do it. And, um, and so obviously you can see that the two images sort of speak to each other um, in this in this formal way, but also in in kind of poetics of the moment. And this notion of us, our bodies, remembering, containing the story, 
um, felt so real, it, urgent, and important uh, in a way that acknowledges the rest of the project. But I also just wanted to say that we all carry those stories. You know, every one of us uh, has that in us. And of course, the visual play and thinking about the vaccine and taking, absorbing this uh, uh, this moment in a in a very particular way. But it, you know, uh, allowing a kind of a, a blossoming or, or flourishing. Um, I don't know. It just seemed like a, it seemed like a good moment to to acknowledge that to shift from the the numbers of the dead and the cases to the number of uh, vaccine doses distributed in the country and and just to just to move on with a different mindset. Um, I don't know what else is what else is coming. What what is what is next? Um, I'm looking forward to my vaccine. Um, um, I was uh, I was in the gallery at the at the at the Mia uh, last week, not too long ago, and it was the first time I I saw the project uh, with my own eyes, and it's kind of incredible because it's been exhibited and present in many places over time, but I I didn't have a chance to actually see it. So, I, so it was interesting and, and moving experience for me to do so, but there were also a few people in there looking at the exhibition and experiencing the work. And I found that to be almost more moving than, uh, than the work itself, just being with other people and sharing that space. Um, so I was thinking about that space as a kind of a story. I was thinking about shared stories. I was thinking about our own individual stories and the the need to to tell them, you know. There is a this awesome term, Zeitzeuge, which is a, a German word for time witness. And um, I think about that word. I almost made a drawing in a series about that, but somehow it didn't happen. Didn't seem uh, right in that moment. But um, you know, I I really do feel that there is a um, there is a a real urgency even today beyond the 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 kind of uh, uh catastrophe of last year to um to really engage with each other like i said uh with a sense of empathy and 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 genuine connection we've lost a sense of gravity i feel ethically uh the understanding of truth had been so methodically chipped away and and damaged for us i think through those connections acknowledging each other connecting we can start maybe finding uh, a bit of um, footing, you know, to stand again and feel like we can actually move forward with some confidence. That's what's next. And I hope that we can all connect at museums. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, I just thank you so much, Peter, for this amazing uh, conversation. It and was extraordinary. For, thank you for sharing your work with us. And I, I just um, feel so genuinely touched and, and lucky to have had you uh, speak to us. Thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, the the conversation. The questions were great. Thanks. Uh, thank you all for uh, for putting your questions forward and and. You know, thank thank you for being part of this crazy journey. It's been such a strange. We've been through a lot this year, so it's good to it's good to feel some kind of connection. Yes, for sure, and hopefully one day we'll be able to connect in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you all for coming and joining us for this, and uh, have a great night. Thank you. <laughs>